uh, my great privilege that we have Dr. Kimberly Thomas from Washington University. Uh, fantastic to have her volunteering to spend some time with us today. Uh, expert in immunology and also infectious disease. You see some of her qualifications there, which are fantastic, obviously. Postdoc at, at UCLA, postdoc at WashU, senior scientist at WashU, and on the research track as an instructor, Department of Pediatrics at WashU, uh, PhD from University of Alabama. Fantastic to have her with us today and over 20 peer reviewed publications in the field of immunology. She's going to walk us through a, a briefing or myth busting to help us all understand the vaccines, the M mRNA vaccines, because this is something that, number one, all of us individually should understand, but also we know we get a lot of questions from our team members about this. And we want to help, help uh, all of you to be able to understand better, but also explain better and help bust some of those myths. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Thomas to walk us through her presentation. Again, huge appreciation, Dr. Thomas, for all the time that you invested in preparing for this session and spending time with us this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really honored and excited to be here to uh, speak with you today about the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Um, and just a quick note, although I am an employee of WashU today, I'm not officially here on behalf of them, but rather on behalf of the scientific community at large and as a resident of the state of Missouri. So I'm hoping today's talk really helps alleviate some of the unknowns and anxiety surrounding these vaccines. Um, and on a personal note, my family and friends have been calling me throughout this pandemic, trying to help them better understand everything they hear on the news and answer all the questions they have about COVID-19 um, vaccines included. So my objectives today are to communicate that these COVID-19 mRNA vaccines are highly safe and effective, um, have minimal potential side effects, and uh, are really crucial for getting society back to quote unquote normal function. And as I was putting together this talk, it seemed to me that maybe the best way for us to learn about the vaccines was perhaps to deconstruct a lot of the myths surrounding them one by one. So I went out and looked up some of the top myths or untruths that were surrounding these vaccines. And um, I'm hoping that together we can go through them. And if you have any questions, please, at any time, uh, let me know and I'll be happy to take them. So the first myth that I found that was really disconcerting is that these vaccines will give you COVID-19, but um, the vaccine isn't actually capable of doing that. And this is why. So to get sick with COVID-19, you need to be infected by this fully intact SARS-CoV-2 virus containing all of its parts, its genetic material. Um, let me put my pointer on. Can you see this? Uh, the genetic material within the virus and also the spike proteins on the surrounding outside portion of the virus. Um, however, these messenger ribonucleic acid or mRNA vaccines only contain four ingredients. They contain messenger RNA or mRNA, lipids, salts, and sugars. The mRNA encodes for the spike protein, which is what your immune system sees first and responds to. And then the salts and sugars are located inside this carrier to help stabilize the mRNA until it gets into your cells. And then lastly, this lipid carrier, which surrounds the mRNA and salts and sugars, and this helps the vaccine get taken up by your cells. So the vaccines can't give you COVID-19 because they physically do not have all the materials required to be infectious. They're just a copy of one piece of virus. Another myth is that these vaccines contain aborted fetal cells. But I just showed you that these vaccines contain four types of materials. Both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines contain um, mRNA, lipids, salts, and sugar. And these ingredients are listed on the vaccine packaging. So you can read exactly what's in the vaccines. Um, no aborted fetal cells. So the next myth is that the vaccine will change your DNA. And to be honest, I had a, a long talk with my brother on this one, actually. Um, but this can't happen for a few reasons. So I'm going to walk through them. Um, first, the vaccine gets taken up. Sorry, my pointer is in the way. Are you going to go up? There you go. The vaccine gets taken up by your cell mediated by that lipid carrier surrounding the vaccine. And then the mRNA is revealed and it's immediately processed 
and it's processed into those spike proteins that it codes for. And these spike proteins are secreted by your cells and then found by your immune system, which then goes along and um, makes that immune memory to protect you from disease. So after the mRNA is processed into these proteins, it actually gets sent to uh, your cell's trash compactor, essentially, and it's degraded. So it's not hanging around for a long time. And then your DNA, uh, your genes, they're located over here in your nucleus on the other part of your cell, and they're surrounded by uh, a nuclear membrane. And the RNA actually can't get through your nuclear membrane and into your nucleus. So there's no way for the mRNA to physically get to your DNA or your genes. Um, and then on top of that, DNA and RNA actually physically can't combine, kind of like oil and water. So these are the reasons why the vaccine can't change your DNA. It gets used up immediately and then degraded. It physically can't get to your DNA because it can't go through this membrane. And then it also can't mix with your DNA. They just physically don't interact. Um, another common misconception is that because the vaccines were ready so quickly compared to other vaccines that we may be familiar with, that corners must have been cut. And this is absolutely false. All vaccines go through the same developmental and regulatory processes, and these vaccines were no exception. And to top it all off, mRNA vaccine technology, even though we call them new vaccines, the technology has been around for a while. It's not brand new. It's been in existence. Um, the ability to use mRNA as a vaccine was discovered in the early 1990s, but it was originally set aside because of low stability and efficacy. Um, however, in the 2010s, scientists identified new technologies like that lipid carrier that I showed you earlier, which helps improve the efficacy of mRNA vaccines. Also, um, we've learned how to do science a lot better and a lot faster. So things move at a faster pace due to additional technologies you may have heard of, like next generation sequencing. And in fact, these mRNA technologies that have been around for the past 20 to 30 years, They've been being used as we're talking to develop vaccines for other diseases um, like Zika and uh, rabies and influenza. There are already vaccines in the developmental process using this mRNA technology. So it's not as new as we might think. And so basically all of the tools for these vaccines that we're seeing, they're already around. They were just ready and waiting to be adapted to be used for SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Um, also, the entire vaccine development process was expedited, and that was for multiple reasons. So over here on the left, you can see a schematic of the vaccine development process. And the timelines for these processes are really dependent on three things, on the urgency or need for the vaccine, and then also on the funds available for vaccine development and production, and then also on the type of vaccine being produced. Some vaccines take longer to make than others. So this being a pandemic where the need is great and urgent and that these are mRNA vaccines, a specific type of, type of technology sped this process up. First, this GMP process development, good manufacturing practice. This was expedited because mRNA vaccines are less complex to make than other vaccine types. And like I mentioned, those lipid carriers and salts and sugars are already being used in other development processes. So they were available to use. Second, because the burden of disease is so high and we have so many cases of COVID-19, trials were able to meet their interim checkpoints a lot quicker than usual. Also, these trials were performed on a global level. So not just in one area, they were pulling patients from all over. Um, uh, third, because this is a pandemic and the need is so great and urgent, and urgent, these licensure agencies moved all of their efforts towards these vaccine productions. They moved them to the top of the to-do list. So they set other things to the side to focus on this. And then fourth, these mRNA vaccines are actually very easy to scale up for mass production compared to other vaccine types. So this step could also be expedited. And then lastly, companies had little monetary risk with the development of these vaccines uh, as the government provided the financial support. So part of Operation Warp Speed 
was that the Department of Health and Human Services provided millions of dollars to these companies to expedite these trials and this development. So readily available funds meant that we could do multiple steps simultaneously, allowing us to speed up this whole process. So collectively, all of these are reasons why we have a vaccine so quickly, not because any corners were cut. The next myth that I've heard of is that these vaccine, vaccines aren't as effective as other vaccines. Well, what does effective mean and, and how do we test this? So efficacy is defined as the percentage reduction of disease in a vaccinated group of people compared to an unvaccinated group of people. And the way we measure this is by immunizing large groups of people with either the vaccine here in red or a placebo in blue. And a placebo is just a harmless fake immunization. Some people will call it salt water or sugar water. And then we monitor over time to see if anyone gets sick. And then we record the number of cases that uh, occurs in each group. So we have case rate over here on the y-axis. And then the number of cases or incidents in the placebo group compared to the vaccinated group tells us how effective the vaccine is. And if we have a low incidence in this vaccine group, that means that the vaccine protects us from disease. So let's look at the trial results. Over here on the left, we have Pfizer, and then on the right, we have Moderna. And you can see that in both trials, vaccination prevented COVID-19 case rate more than placebo treatment did. And this is seen by these low level of cases in the vaccinated groups for both trials. And then importantly, there were similar numbers of cases in both the vaccinated Pfizer group and the vaccinated Moderna group, suggesting that these vaccines are similarly and highly effective. Um, neither is better than the other. They're both great vaccines. So how do these vaccine results compare to other vaccine trials? Um, when we compare to two other vaccine trials, the shingles vaccine trial that was run by GlaxoSmithKline, and then the Prevnar pneumococcal vaccine trial, which was also run by Pfizer, we actually find that there are very few differences between the trials with respect to number of enrollees and efficacy. Um, you can see that all four trials had enrolled tens of thousands of individuals. So some trials are not enrolling 100 people versus 100,000 people. They're all within the same area. And then also you can see that the efficacy was on par with the shingles vaccine. 95% for Pfizer, 94.1% for Moderna, and 97% for Shingles vaccine. And actually, these vaccines for SARS-CoV-2 are even more effective than the Prevnar pneumococcal vaccine. And I highlight this because this Prevnar pneumococcal vaccine is actually licensed for use and being actively used. So we have better efficacy than uh, current vaccines that are already in use. And lastly, some people are saying, how can you tell if something is effective when you have such low numbers of cases, right? If you enrolled 43,000 people, but you only have 162 cases of disease, how can you tell it's effective? Um, but this is standard practice across all trials. Um, you can see here 210, 90. These numbers are all on par. So these trials were run with the same integrity and you get the similar efficacy as other trials. So no difference there between those trials. There we go. Oh, too far, sorry. So another rumor is that these vaccines are not safe to take. Um, and this is also false. The FDA and independent safety monitoring teams found that these vaccines are in fact very safe to take and the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risk of not being vaccinated and there were no vaccine-related deaths, and serious adverse events were extremely rare in both trials. In fact, you have a higher risk of dying in a car crash on a daily basis than you do of having a severe reaction to the vaccine. Um, so reports of a few allergic reactions to the vaccines in the past week have caused people to think that the vaccines are not safe for people with allergies. Um, however, allergic reactions to vaccines are not standard or expected, and the normal rate of somebody having a, an allergic reaction to a vaccine is one in a million. Um, also, allergies are highly specific. Uh, for instance, people who are allergic to pineapple, that's the one thing they're allergic to, and it's very specific. So if you are allergic to the few ingredients that are in the vaccine, then of course you shouldn't take it. 
but you probably know if you are allergic to those specific ingredients because allergies are so specific. And then when you arrive to get your vaccine, you're gonna fill out a screening questionnaire like you see on the right over here. And this is gonna be done with your healthcare provider to determine if you are at risk for an allergic reaction. And if you are, then you won't be given the vaccine. And then everybody who gets the vaccine has to wait for 15 minutes. And this is because allergic reactions happen almost instantaneously. Um, so we want you to be in a healthcare setting if you are going to have a reaction so that you can get the treatment, which is normally, I know a lot of you have probably heard of epinephrine or the use of an EpiPen and then Benadryl to manage that severe ana anaphylactic shock. And then lastly, doctors pretty much agree that if you have common mild allergies, there is no reason to not get the vaccine. You should be A-OK -okay to get it. Um, and then lastly, there's a rumor going around that these vaccines cause infertility. And I actually struggled to find out where this rumor came from because it was so vague. And it's a completely baseless blog post um, where somebody suggested that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein was similar enough to your placental proteins that your immune system would then attack, attack your placenta and cause infertility. Um, however, these proteins are less than 20% similar, and uh, a neonatal immunologist suggested that it would be like confusing a rhinoceros for a jaguar because they were wearing the same collar. So it just goes to show you how, how bizarre of a statement this was, and we actually have no evidence to suggest that these vaccines would cause infertility, and other vaccines do not cause infertility as well. And then just kind of a, a mind game would be the vaccine induces antibodies against the spike protein. Well, when you naturally get infected by SARS-CoV-2, you also make antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So that would imply that all of the women in the world who have now had COVID-19 would now be infertile. And if that was the case, I, I assure you, we would have heard about that. So that is definitely um, a myth. So that's not to say that you won't have some side effects after the vaccine. So I just wanted to touch on maybe what you can expect after you get the vaccine for the following two to three days. Um, the, top side, the top five side effects that were experienced by individuals in both trials were arm pain, headaches, fatigue, chills, and muscle pain. Um, but let's go through these. So as you can see, most people, roughly 80% of all individuals, reported mild to moderate arm pain after receiving the vaccine. And this went away by roughly three days afterwards. Less than half the people who received the vaccine reported a headache, most of them mild in nature. Again, less than half the people receiving the vaccine reported some fatigue, both mild to moderate. Um, again, so one in two people will feel tired after the vaccine. And then most people did not report having any chills, but for those that did, the majority of them said they had mild chills for a couple of days post-vaccination. And then lastly, muscle pain was reported in about 21% of the individuals who received the vaccine. So I think the important thing to know is that these are actually all common side effects of vaccination, very similar to a flu vaccine and can be handled with Tylenol. When I got my flu vaccine earlier this year, uh, I actually made a comment to one of my friends saying, wow, this one hurt more this year than last year. And my arm was definitely in pain for a couple of days. But again, these are common for, for most vaccinations. And then um, just a couple more notes is that they reported that the people who were older over the age of 55 reported less pain than those individuals in the 16 to 55 year old groups. And then um, some of these side effects were a little more pronounced after the second dose. Um, and that's because your immune system is doing its job. It's recognizing um, the vaccine much quicker. And so it's responding. So that's a good thing. And this kind of ties into the next um, myth is that people are saying, well, why do I need to take both doses? I should just take one dose. I only take one dose of the flu vaccine. Well, unfortunately, we have to take both doses for these vaccines. Um, and the reason is, is we need them both so we can build that really robust immune memory to SARS-CoV-2 and prevent disease. And so I just wanted to touch on a couple of things about the two doses. The doses are three to four weeks apart. Um, so just have your calendar handy when you go get your first dose so you can mark 
when you're going to get your second one, depending on if you have Pfizer or Moderna. Pfizer is 28 days and Moderna, or Pfizer is 21 days and Moderna is 28 days. Um, next, both of these doses need to be from the same company. If you got Moderna for dose one, you need to get Moderna for dose two. You can't mix and match. And then when you get your first dose, they're gonna give you a COVID-19 vaccination record card. And this is great because it allows you to keep track of which dose you got. And I know a lot of people are taking pictures of these, so they have them on their phone, so they know exactly which dose they have. So when they go back to the next one, they can get the same thing. And then, like I mentioned above, the side effects may be a little bit worse after your second dose, but that just means that your immune memory is working. So both doses, not just one. And then I think the last myth is that as soon as you're vaccinated, you can take your mask off. Um, unfortunately, I know we all want to take our masks off, but this is not the case. If we take, we can't take our masks off until a lot more people are vaccinated. Um, we essentially have to reach a level of herd immunity. So in the US, that means 210 million people need to be vaccinated. Um, so I wanted to look a little bit closer at the concept of herd immunity. I'm sure you've heard the term around a lot, and I think this image really helps to understand it. So if you look here on the top left panel, um, the people in blue, uh, they have no immunity, so they have never been infected by SARS-CoV-2 before. Um, and then if there are people who have SARS-CoV-2 infections, the disease spreads throughout the population relatively quickly, which is what we're seeing now. Um, in the middle panel here, uh, you have a similar situation, but you have a few yellow individuals. And these yellow individuals are um, immunized. So they have seen the SARS-CoV-2 virus before and probably had COVID-19. So we say that they're immunized and have immunity. Um, however, there aren't enough people in the population with immunity such that when you have two infected individuals come into the population, they get all of the blue people sick. And so we still have spread of the disease. Um, but in this last panel down here, uh, you see that most of the population has immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And so when these sick individuals come in, they can't transmit to uh, any new um, unimmunized people. And so we are able to uh, stop the spread of disease. So it's this last panel here that is herd immunity. And um, experts have identified for this virus specifically based on its R naught, which I think Dr. Powderly talked to you about, we need to reach 70% of the population to have immunity before we will achieve this situation and stop the spread of disease. So how do we get from here where we're at now, where people are still getting sick to herd immunity? Um, we have two options. We can let natural immunity run its course. Um, but this is gonna result in an estimated three to five million more deaths from COVID-19. That's a hundred times the amount of deaths that have already occurred in the United States. And this is just US numbers. I don't even know what the global scale would be. Um, alternatively, we can vaccinate everyone and this would save many, 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 many lives. Um, so until we reach herd immunity where the rest of the population is protected, we need to keep practicing these three W's, even though we're slowly getting everybody vaccinated. We need to wash our hands, watch our distance and stay six feet apart, and wear our masks. And the reason is because while vaccination keeps you from getting sick, personally, it doesn't mean that you can't harbor the virus and spread it to other unvaccinated individuals, like in that middle panel that I showed you. So I think I wanted to end with this thought. Um, Currently, we are all here, uh, masked up, physically isolated and distanced and surrounded by virus. And we really want to get back to quote unquote normal, whatever your normal is, if it's family gatherings, going to sporting events, going out into the bar and having a beer and celebrating. And the only way we get there is through herd immunity. That's, that's how we're going to get there. And we have two options. We can let natural immunity take its course, like I mentioned. This is uh, estimated, we have no clue how long this could take. It could take years. And again, the cost of three to five million more lives. Or we can vaccinate everybody. And this is really the safest and fastest. And if we all get on board and do it, we get back to quote unquote normal quicker. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and I'd be happy to answer any questions.